Well, welcome everyone to the Herbert C. Kalman Seminar uh, on International Conflict, which um, as you know, is co-sponsored by the Program on Negotiation as well as the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. And um, we would really wanna welcome you, especially all of you from uh, outside of the United States. We're delighted that you can join us here today for this very last seminar of, of the semester, of two, and the last seminar of 2020. And we're thrilled that we have um, our friend and our colleague, uh, Susan Hackley, the Managing Director of the Program on Negotiation here. And we're gonna, she and I are gonna have a, a back and forth, an interview, and we're gonna ask her questions about her time at uh, the Program on Negotiation and just ask her to reflect um, on her experiences. And before we get into that, I want to um, just tell you that this, this seminar is being recorded. And if anyone would like to share it um, with others, you can, in a couple of days, wait and go to the uh, Program on Negotiation website, and um, it's archived there. So, uh, and the, the other thing I wanted to say is that if you wanted to make any comments or anything, please do that in the chat function. Um, and we will, Susan and I will be talking and I'll be interviewing Susan for about 40 minutes, after which we will uh, open it up for a Q and A. And if anybody has a question, please put that in the Q and A function. So Susan, um, we are so happy to have you here. Uh, Susan's title for her talk, uh, for this interview is From 9-11 to COVID-19, my 19 years uh, at the program on negotiation. Uh, what an what a opening and closing she had. But you know, before, uh, before I start interviewing Susan, I just wanna say that um, we are, we, uh, all of us who put this Kelman seminar together, including Professor Herbert Kelman, who's listening here today, we all wanna thank you, Susan, for your incredible contributions to making this seminar, um, not just good, but great. And we would not have been able to do it without you. And it's been 20 years since we've been doing this together and Susan and her team have, which includes James Kerwin and Anna Chang and Diane Long, they have uh, really made an effort. And Susan is the one who, who led the whole, uh, that whole enterprise. So we thank you so very much. Herb Kelman thanks you so very much. He said, he told me uh, yesterday that he's valued your contribution enormously. And he has not just your contribution to the seminar, but he's valued your friendship. And he said, even though he's happy for you, he's going to miss you. So um, without further ado, I want to also before we go into the questions, I wanted to read a couple of um, a couple of comments that people at PON had. I'm only going to read two. There were so many people who wanted to say something about Susan. Uh, but I, I, I wanted to pick a couple because it really does set the stage for who Susan is in relation to program on negotiation and how she's valued and how she's loved by and beloved by everyone there. I think I can speak for everyone at PON. They are they're so proud of her and so happy that she made the contribution that she did. So here's a, here's a, a, a very short um, description of what Alan uh, Lemper feel how he feels about Susan. He said, if PON were a body, Susan would be its living heart. She was the energy at the crossroads, bringing together faculty, staff, students, and participants from all over the world. She supported each one of us with her quiet, responsible leadership. She knew how to nurture the best in us and still be pushed and still pushed us to innovate for even better. What I learned from Susan as a leader is that in negotiation, you can bring your heart to work. So Alan, I thought that was beautiful. And that the last one I'm gonna share uh, was from 
uh, is written by Dan Shapiro. Susan has taught me two critical negotiation lessons. One is how to truly be soft on the person and hard on the problem. Over the years, I've watched negotiators at all levels struggle to embody that maxim. They either give in on substance to preserve the relationship or win the deal, but lose the connection. Susan epitomizes that unique leader who treats everyone with dignity while tackling tough issues with fairness and thoughtful problem solving. Second, Susan has taught me that negotiation is not an end in itself. It can be a means for bringing about a more peaceful planet. Her work to educate the world about issues of peace, justice, and the impact of war on children has inspired countless people around the world, myself included, and will have an impact for generations to come. So Susan, I just wanted you to, to, to you know, just sort of bathe in that while we're having this conversation because you're, you're so loved by everyone at PON. And I, I would like to read um, your bio before we start as well. And because your Susan's bio is, is remarkable in and of itself, everything that she's done in her life before PON, which I'll ex explain to you here. Susan has been managing director of the program on negotiation at Harvard Law School since 2001. PON, a consortium program of Harvard, MIT, and Tufts University, has since the 1980s played a leadership role in developing the field of negotiation and dispute resolution. In her role at PON, Susan oversees all operations and activities, which include a wide range of public events, educational programs, research seminars, publications, and executive education courses. A graduate of the Harvard Kennedy School, Susan has taught negotiation and communication in China, Singapore, Italy, Slovakia, Belgium, Denmark, Spain, and the United States. Before joining PON as managing director, she co-founded an internet company, GivenNation.com, an e-philanthropy portal dedicated to helping people connect to the causes that they care about. Prior to that, she worked in politics as a policy analyst and speech writer for numerous political candidates and served as communications director of the Massachusetts Democratic Party. Her interests include examining the role of journalists reporting on wars and how important but often overlooked um, and untold is the work of conflict management professionals in preventing or managing the aftermath of war. She also has drawn connections between the fields of negotiation and nonviolent action. In her view, the two best methods humanity has developed for dealing productively with conflict. She produced and directed a documentary film, Veteran Children, When Parents Go to War, about the impact of America's children, uh, impact of war on America's children and families. The film premiered on Indiana Public Television in April 2019 and has won numerous awards. And finally, she has served as chair of the Board of uh, Trustees of the Alliance for Peace Building, a Washington DC based nonpartisan network of organizations working around the world to end violent conflict and sustain peace. So my dear friend, Susan Hackley, um, I'm going to just start by saying how much I too have valued our, our working relationship, not to mention our, our friendship. And while this is actually a bittersweet moment for me because I'm thrilled for you that you are going to retire and spend more time doing the things that you've put on hold for so many years. And I'm just delighted and I hope I can join you with some of, some of that fun and excitement. On the other hand, um, I'm terribly sad uh, to see my partner at the Herbert C. Kellman seminar um, retire. And I know, um, I know it's, been, um, it's been a wonderful ride, the two of us, what we've all done together with the seminar and it just won't be the same without you. So thank you, thank you for everything. Donna, thank you so much. And 
Thank you, all of you. I wish I could see your faces. Um, I love seeing in the chat where you're calling in from, you know, Macedonia, um, Asia, Africa, Europe, all over the US, Canada, my son in Alaska and friends in Alaska, my stepson in Germany. Um, it's just fabulous. And thank you so much. You've You've enriched my life so much, those of you who've connected with the program on negotiation. And Donna, I can't imagine a better person to be doing this with. Your, your work on dignity, the um, work we've done together about trying to get journalists to report on peace building as well as fighting wars, um, all the things we've shared about nonviolent action, it's, it's really been a joy. And a special hello to Herbert C. Kelman, um, the guiding light and the inspiration for this seminar. And the seminar, um, we started it right after 9-11 and we focused it on negotiation conflict in the news media because we were so um, concerned about how the buildup to war didn't take into consideration the negotiators and peace builders who might have had something really different to say about it. And I, I just want to, before I start, um, Thank all the faculty I've worked with over the years. Um, a number of them were founders of the program on negotiation years ago, Larry Suskind, Frank Sander, Howard Rafa, um, Bruce Patton, uh, you know, Mike Wheeler was very involved and Roger Fisher, of course. And um, I just wanna thank Robert Manukin, uh, who took over as chairman of the program on negotiation after Roger Fisher. Uh, I came in when Roger Fisher was still there, Bob Anukin became chair and now Guhan Subramanian is chair. So I feel like I've had the real pleasure of spanning these three leadership regimes of PON. But especially important to me was my 25 years um, of knowing and working with Bob Manukin. Oh, that's lovely. I'm sure he's beaming right now, Susan. So why don't we start get started with the uh, interview? The first question I have for you, Susan, is that you you started your job at PON as the managing uh, managing director right after 9/11, and now we're in the middle of the worst public health crisis this country has ever seen. So reflecting back on when you started on 9/11. Uh, right after 9-11 and thinking about where we are now in the COVID crisis. Do you see any similarities or any differences? Yes, so I literally started my job as managing director one week after 9-11. So it was September 17th, um, 2001. And I felt, of course, so horrified by what had happened also so grateful that here I was in a job working with people who are committed to helping people bridge differences, solve problems, deal with conflict. So I've always felt so blessed to be in this field. And part of what I want to do today is encourage everyone to be a peace builder. And I thought from day one that uh, if the program on negotiation could help people around the world become peace builders in their own communities. That should be part of our mission. So 9-11 happened. And one of the first things we worked on was putting together a public event at Harvard Law School with Bob Mnookin and Roger Fisher about do you negotiate with terrorists? Uh, it was an important question then politically, um, ethically, morally, all the different ways we had to look at it. And there are arguments um, for and against. So now with the pandemic, which we see people around the world suffering horrifically, and we don't even yet know how long this will take or will another pandemic happen. But certainly in our country, we're seeing a, a huge disconnect uh, among people who wanna take certain measures to reduce the incidence of the coronavirus and others who have ideas about herd immunity or not getting a vaccine or this and that. So it feels that the work we all do is 
more important than ever mm -hmm. as we really basically try to help people bridge their divides, find some common ground. And common ground with the pandemic should at the least be, we don't want overcrowded hospitals. We don't want our health workers getting sick. We don't want people in nursing homes and elderly getting sick. So we should be able to find common ground and work on that. Well, I hope you're right, Susan. Um, I think it's gonna take some, um, some really uh, clever and creative ways to bridge those divides. And uh, I, know, I know many, many people in our field are, are working on that. So you're right, this is, this, is, this is part of our job and our responsibility to try to help bridge that. And the next thing I wanted to, to um, ask you to reflect on is that uh, PON uh, started with a seminal book by Roger Fisher and Bill Urey, Getting to Yes. Have you seen the message of that brilliant book? Have you seen that message evolve over the years? And if so, tell us about that. So Howard Rafa, one of the founders of the program on negotiation said, it's a great way to launch a field with a bestseller. And getting to yes was really, still is a bestseller. Uh, it's been translated into languages around the world. It gives simple but not simplistic advice about how to deal with conflict. And I think it's held up so well over the years. Um, and it's inspired many scholars to build on those ideas, separate the people from the problem, um, go to the balcony as one of PON's other founders, Bill Urey, um, so memorably said, uh, separate interests from from um, options, uh, look for your best alternative, all these different things. And we need to remember that negotiation is really a fairly new field that was basically um, turbocharged in the 80s. And that it, the, the monumental change or the revolution that happened then was the old way was you had to be a hard bargainer and you had to um, know how to bluff, maybe mislead, maybe even lie, be tough, deliver ultimatums. And Roger Fisher, Bill Urey, and, and Bruce Patton said, no, there's another way that will work better if you look at both sides and how they both sides can do better, um, which often leads to more sustainable agreements. And uh, it was really a, a revolutionary idea in its time. So I think it's evolved in that there are many sophisticated scholarly um, jumping off points from that. There's a lot done now with neurology and behavioral science and economics and uh, implicit bias and lots of things that uh, were inspired, I think, by looking at this. Uh, how do you think about yourself, your self-awareness? So I do think it can, continues to evolve. I also think getting to yes holds up very well. It certainly has. And um, I wanted to, um, to ask you um, about, well, as a postdoctoral fellow, I came to Harvard 30 years ago to work with Professor Herbert Kelman. And what I remember, um, in addition to all my excitement about working with Professor Kelman was how, how much uh, their excitement there was surrounding the getting to yes approach to negotiation, the principled negotiation approach. It was revolutionary at the time. And it was truly a sensation. There was such a buzz and people were coming to executive programs from all over the world. And you've done many of those programs. It, even recently, do you still see the same excitement? I really do. I think people can take a negotiation program and it often just transforms their lives. It's amazing. Um, these basic ideas that um, you should express empathy with the other person, you should listen to learn. Active listening is, is a core part of it. There's a framework that um, you can use to prepare for and conduct negotiations. Uh, Roger Fisher had the seven elements. Bob Manukin has a wonderful framework of the three tensions. 
um, and, and introduce the idea of um, looking how the interests of principals and agents can differ. Um, I, I remember going um, several times to China uh, with Bob Anukin first and then on my own to give trainings uh, on negotiation on behalf of the program on negotiation. And one of the first times we did it was with a group, the Hong Kong Railway. And we thought, wow, are they gonna open up at all? Uh, we had our cultural stereotypes, all this talk about empathy and sharing your feelings and dealing with emotion. How is that gonna go? And at partway through the first day with the Hong Kong Railway, one of the participants, a very elegant um, man from Hong Kong took me aside and he said, I could leave this seminar right now and I would have gotten something so amazing from it. He said, I now know how I want to communicate with my wife. <laughs> so there are lots of moments like that because negotiation helps us with our personal relationships. Um, my daughter, I hear lots of things she says about negotiating coming right back at me. And I think our families, our friends, these are just great skills for everybody. I also want to just briefly say, I've worked for about 15 years with a wonderful group called Women to Women, and they offer trainings uh, to young women, 18, 20 year olds, uh, many from the Middle East, and I'll give them a negotiation training uh, once a year, sometimes twice a year, and in an hour, I can really persuade these amazing young women who will be leaders, how important negotiating will be to them so that their voices will be heard in discussions. So they'll have a place at the table where decisions are being made. And so I would say it's absolutely transformative negotiation trainings. Um, and some of the programs are long, but even in an hour, I think it really can change people's lives. Susan, where else did you do the women to women um, training? Well, we did a, a training this summer from Bahrain uh, with a wonderful group. Everything's virtual now, but that's worked well too because uh, the communication is good through chat uh, and you can see everybody's faces. We can't today because this is a webinar, but on the typical trainings you can. Uh, we went to Belgium. Uh, there also have been trainings, most of them were in Cambridge, Massachusetts when the girls could travel. And so, our, well, I, I'm just fascinated by this. I didn't really know about this project. So is this mostly um, women who are looking to become leaders? Yeah, so they, they apply and they self-identify and they're, they're amazing. They, you know, they speak English really well. And it's not their native language. They have lots of energy. Uh, you know they're gonna be leaders because even the fact that they found themselves to this women to women program, which is put on by Empower Peace, which is based in Boston. Oh, great. That sounds wonderful. So let me ask you this, Susan, is there something about the negotiating negotiation executive trainings that most participants um, feel was a real awakening for them? Uh, would you describe it as a aha moment? And if the answer is yes to that, could you give us some examples? Yeah, so I think I just gave one of the Hong Kong Railway. Um, certainly business people sometimes come to trainings and then they realize, oh, I have not listened to my staff. I've told them things or I haven't listened to my family. It's, it's often people who are assertive and not good at listening. However, there are a lot of people who are timid and uh, good listeners, but don't know how to assert. And one of Bob Manukin's three tensions is tension between assertiveness and empathy, and it's good to balance those. And so we talk with people about what's your conflict style? Do you avoid conflict? Are you? Some people say, oh, negotiation, that's just compromise. It's not, but a lot of people around the world believe that. Negotiation is instead this whole set of complex interactions you have, or Jim Sabanius, another one of PON's founders, has written really um, beautifully about 3D negotiations, being able to look at a negotiation um, in multi-dimensions 
Uh, and he talks about negotiation campaigns, you're not just doing a single negotiation. So I, I think we see all these aha moments as people realize it's not just simple, it's complex. You can use your tools in sophisticated ways, but really principled negotiation is what we're about. You know, you don't lie, you care about fairness, you care about ethics, but you're still an effective and strong negotiator. Yeah, I remember, Susan, the, uh, the whole idea of trying to go beneath the positions that people bring to a negotiation. Everybody has their positions all very nicely articulated. But what I, what I loved about um, the principled negotiation was the whole idea is to get beneath that, to take a look at what the interests are that are driving, um, that are driving the, um, the, the reason for you know, wanting what they want. And that, that I think was revolutionary, actually. I agree. I think that's one of the core principles. Really? Ask about somebody's interests. And that endures to this day, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so Susan, you personally have made so many contributions to the program on negotiation. And I uh, especially liked uh, the Great Negotiators Project. How did that come about? And was it difficult to get some of the recipients um, to accept the award? Well, it, it um, had started before I became managing director. The first great negotiator um, award recipient was George Mitchell for his work in Northern Ireland, and then Charlene Barshevsky for her work as um, US trade representative to China. So the great negotiator award is something given by the program on negotiation to an individual who has had um, negotiation achievements with a lasting and significant impact on society. So in two cases, we offered the award to people who had already won the Nobel Peace Prize. And we thought, well, are they going to accept it? Um, happily, they did. One was the former president of Finland, Marti Atasari. Uh, so uh, he accepted the award. And another one was um, former president uh, Juan Manuel Santos of Colombia, who had recently got the, um, the Nobel Peace Prize. And he was a wonderful recipient of this award because um, his peace agreement, uh, which has challenges certainly, but was a remarkable peace agreement, uh, had recently happened. And he did something quite unusual, and we've made a short film about it, which is on the PON website, you can look at for free, about how he used a team of negotiation experts from around the world, about five or six of them, who flew to Colombia numerous times to advise him on how to succeed in these negotiations. And Bill Yuri was one of them. Uh, so that's been so interesting. And I, I think also, that we've given the award to a lot of different people, including Christo and Jean-Claude. And that was Bob Manukin's idea and their artists uh, who did these amazing projects like wrapping fabric around the Reichstag in, in Berlin or putting up the gates in Central Park. And uh, so they were in Boston for a talk at the Museum of Fine Arts and Jim Sabanius and I went over to their hotel room in the Ritz-Carlton to ask them if they'd be interested in this. And they were chain smoking illegally in the hotel. They laugh so much. They're just these delightful, um, very free spirited people. And they said, well, we don't think of ourselves as a negotiator. And we're saying, well, how did you manage to get all these projects built? Um, they didn't raise money from other sources. They made all the money for those projects from selling their art uh, and getting all the permitting and this and that. So. We've had wonderful experiences with our great negotiator programs and learned from some remarkable people. Yeah, that's that was, I remember that one event in particular with, with Christo and his wife, Jean-Claude. It was, it was really, it was quite a, quite a moment in PON history. That was terrific. Um, so Susan, the, a project that you did uh, develop on your own was the PON Global, which is an initiative that well, I'm, I, wanna, I want you to talk, I'm, I'm not gonna explain it, but so tell me 
what were the challenges in developing that program, PON Global, and what were the joys for you personally? Well, I really love the PON Global project. So about five and a half years ago, uh, Bob Anukin, Guhan Subramanian, and I met to think about how we could respond to the many requests PON would get to put on executive education programs in other countries. We put on a lot of programs pre-pandemic in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but not everyone can travel to Cambridge. So how could we go abroad and do it, but not have our senior faculty have to jump on a plane and take the time to do that. Um, and so we, we created the idea of PON Global. It was very unusual, really the first kind of program at Harvard where we would go and form partnerships with entities in other countries and they would be responsible for enrolling the people, setting up the room and the space and we would bring instructors and we also created hours of very high quality teaching videos to go along with the um, in-person instruction. So the first one we did about five years ago was in Tokyo. Uh, then we did the next one in Tel Aviv and I was going over to Tel Aviv and um, I'd had an inquiry from some people in Saudi Arabia and I thought, well, I'll stop by and see if they'd be viable partners. So after going to Israel, I flew to Jordan and I flew to Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. And, and they were amazed that a woman alone, I had my burqa uh, that I got on the way to the airport in Boston, um, would come alone and uh, meet with them. Uh, but I liked, I liked them, I liked what we learned and we had a very successful partnership for many years with them. So we've had PON Global now in 15 countries, um, Hong Kong, South America, Mexico, Europe, um, Middle East, so it's wonderful. And now it's all virtual. We had our first PON Global virtual course and then we had people from all over the world. So we're offering that again in February and March. Um, so it's wonderful and I'm hoping someday we do a version of it for people in the nonprofit world who can't afford to, to take a course, uh, but we offer some virtual version of it um, for all, all kinds of people. So do you think it'll it remain virtual for the most part? Uh, yeah, I think we'll do both. We can't wait to get back yeah. um, and be with our partners in our countries. The last one we had was um, in Milan. Uh, we had one scheduled in February for Beirut. Uh, it, it couldn't happen. We just had to cancel it. We had several. So we're we very much want to get back to that because then we learn from them. We learn from the people, but I think maybe we'll do both virtual and uh, in person. Yeah, but what a contribution. It just gives people who wouldn't otherwise be able to travel to Cambridge an opportunity to, um, to take advantage of the, of the teachings and the, and the powerful trainings that you do. So that's, that was, must feel very gratifying knowing that you're leaving that one behind. So mm -hmm. successful, such a successful project. Well, here, here is my favorite um, of the work that you've done. Not, I mean, so many things, but your documentary film, Veteran Children, When Parents Go to War. It really is one of my personal favorites. And I'm just curious, I know there are many influences that you know provoked you to do this kind of documentary film, but was there something about your years at the program on negotiation that also contributed to your desire to create this beautiful film? Thank you, Donna. Um, so I made this film as a half hour documentary film and finished it in 2019. And we've shown it at the US Institute of Peace and many other places. I was deeply inspired by the buildup um, to the war in Iraq and how marginalized I felt our peace building community was in that, in that discussion. And also my son, Zach, uh, had joined the US Marine Corps before 9-11. So no thought that we'd be at war, at least as his mother. Uh, then 9-11 happens, uh, the Afghanistan war, which he wasn't in, but, um, he was, I knew he'd be headed 
he'd be on his way to Iraq if we went to war. So that certainly has um, inspired me to try to do something. And my idea with this film was to bridge this divide in our country between um, the civilian Americans and military and veteran Americans um, who don't inter interconnect as much as I feel they should. And somebody said this to me this morning on another meeting that, well, I'm scared of them. And cause you know, they're soldiers and they've got all that stuff. And I said, yeah, well, we gotta, we gotta, you know, they're our sons and fathers and daughters. And so that really inspired me. And um, there's this quotation um, that Seth Moulton, Congressman Seth Moulton read at an event we had Donna, you and I uh, and Herb at the Kelman Sem seminar when I showed an early part of my film. And I just wanna read it cause this inspired me. It's on the wall of the Harvard Memorial Church and it's a memorial to the um, dead Harvard men who died in World War I. And if ever there was a war that shouldn't have happened, it's, it's, it's World War I, uh, which was just bungled diplomacy, um, you know, bad coalitions. Anyway, here, here's the, the, um, the quote to these young veterans who gave, these young soldiers who gave their lives. While a bright future beckoned, they freely gave their lives and fondest hopes for us and our allies that we might learn from them courage in peace to spend our lives making a better world for others. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping with this film to just in a small way, open up that conversation. And I wanna say the film focuses on um, the children of American soldiers who've been in Iraq or Afghanistan and the impact on children of a parent being in combat and going to war. But I wanna say, of course, it's much worse for the children in Iraq and Afghanistan where the wars were actually fought. But this is just a start and I'm hoping um, people in other countries might interview their own children. And I've had friends from Israel and Rwanda and elsewhere say, yeah, we need this in our countries too. We talk about the impact of war on their children. Well, I, I think uh, that Diane is uh, putting up a link to that uh, in, in the chat uh, function. So I hope people watch it. Be, be prepared to be extremely moved by this. It's, it's a beautiful, touching, um, and you know, timely, really certainly timely uh, film. All right, Susan, one last question before we open it up to our audience for a Q&A. And you have talked a lot about how the field has changed. What do you see for the future? So I think the um, negotiation is all about problem solving and we see lots of problems in the world. And I think we're seeing more and more scholars and practitioners and citizens use these tools. Um, we see more of it in the schools, uh, but we should, it should be part of our learning. Uh, how do you deal with bullies? How do you deal with um, poor relationships? Um, how do you deal with your emotions? Dan Shapiro's done such important work about your, you're gonna have your emotions. You can't just stuff them in a box and people you're negotiating with have their emotions. How do you deal with it? Um, I think journalists need to be more a part of this conversation. How do we report on conflict? It's not just who wins or loses a war and that's the end of it. It's um, how, what about the wars that are prevented? Uh, we're going to see a lot of unrest with climate change. And I think um, those of us in negotiation, peace building community, community should be part of that. Um, basically, at PON and many of us on this call, we believe in the power of negotiation to change your lives and change the world. They're just great skills that if we deploy, they're easy to talk about, but hard to deploy. And there are lots of people with fractured family relationships 
Um, and I guess we can start there, but also in our communities and bridging all our divides. Yes, well, that is certainly needed right now, given the political culture that we've, uh, we've been experiencing for the last, you know, the talk about the disconnection and the, and the divides. I think we need, we need some good negotiating skills to get us through that. And I'm sure, I'm sure the principled negotiation approach could be extremely helpful. So Susan, thank you for that very, very much. That such insight and wisdom that you shared with us. Um, there are people who have questions for you. And I think we'll, we'll start um, just addressing some of these questions. So here, here's a woman um, who has a, this is Janet Bick, Bickett. I hope I said that right. Uh, she said, I have a master's degree in communication. I want to work in, and train people on conflict resolution, negotiation, and interpersonal communication. Is there a degree path I can pursue to achieve this? I'm looking to obtain a PhD and possibly another master's. Wow, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I was an English major uh, in college, and then I went to Harvard Kennedy School. I was in politics uh, and then co-founded an internet company. So I came from a very non-traditional background to this work. So I would say, first of all, getting a PhD is wonderful if that's what you want to do. And I think you can look at our website um, and check out the negotiation journal and some of our faculty um, may have good advice for you. Uh, and we give graduate research fellowships to people working on their PhDs in this field. So um, there are lots of good directions to go on, on, but I would also say you don't have to have that to do this work uh, in some ways. So um, I'm just hoping everybody out there becomes part of this movement. Okay, Susan, thank you. Um, here's one from Rose, uh, wait a minute, what happened to it? it just, it, no, here it is. Okay, so from Lakshmi um, Raj, Rajiv, my greetings to the panel members. Being a X grader, I've been, I don't know what that means. I've been involved in, um, in model United Nations and such events. We can actually see the strategic role that negotiation plays in bringing people to a consensus or rather convincing them to, to support something. As far as I've seen, each time we negotiate, there opens a, do a new door which comes with its own problems, pros and cons. How do we choose the best strategy from them? I, I think it's great that um, you have that awareness that this isn't easy. And every time you open up a conversation, it may go in directions we don't like, but it probably goes in directions that need to happen. An awful lot of conflict is buried. Um, you know, I think of, the nonviolent action strategists um, who say that, you know, you're saying no to unaddressed needs, you're saying yes to social justice. What do, you, what do you want to achieve with these conversations? What is your goal? Prepare for messiness and emotion and challenges. Um, I think it's good to train as a mediator. Uh, and learn negotiation skills so you know how to handle it uh, when things get really difficult. And certainly in the United States, there's just work that all of us here need to do to not just listen to people in our own bubbles, uh, but to go to other parts of the country or other parts of our community and really engage with people with strong differences. So I think, I think you learn from practice how to do it, um, but avoiding conflict is, is no solution either. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are a couple of people asking questions about uh, how to apply these negotiation um, skills to what's happening today in our, divided, in our divided country. Is there anything more you wanna add to that, Susan? Well, I'd just add that um, several of our faculty at the Program on Negotiation are working with members of Congress and their staff uh, and there's uh, definitely problem solving groups within uh, Congress uh, where there's so much dissension and dysfunction. So I think it's just rolling up our sleeves and, and doing the hard work. I, 
I don't want to forget to mention um, just how there's some of these unusual non-traditional ways of helping deal with conflict. And so I want to mention the Abraham Path Initiative, uh, which is which is unusual. And it's a um, a cultural historical walking trail through the Middle East. And seven or so years ago, I had the pleasure of going with the founder, William Urey, and others um, to help look at some of the early parts of the Abraham Path. And it goes from Turkey to Syria, Jordan, Palestine, Israel, and maybe other countries um, beyond eventually. Um, you can look up its website. And it's it's just a way to broaden the discussion about it's not just conflict in the Middle East, it's how about job opportunity, how about hospitality, which was a core tenet of the patriarch Abraham. So there's just a lot of amazing, wonderful, innovative work being done where you take the core principles of negotiation, conflict resolution, and put them to work in different venues and contexts. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Uh, th this one is from Larry Rodrigo Morillo Cardenas. Um, and he said, thank you for this wonderful talk. Do you have any recommendations for us young professionals who want to pursue a career in negotiation and problem solving? Fabulous. So um, I would say to everybody, if you're interested in this, please come to the PON website often. We have lots of free material, lots of articles, lots of topical content, special reports. Um, so you can learn a lot just from that. We really try to be a good resource. And I think um, it's a wonderful goal to have. And I think start trying to do it a little. I mean, it was great the previous questioner talking about United, model United Nations, there's debate, there's mediation, there's so many ways that you can just um, start to get involved, start to use some of the principles, see where it takes you. I, I had just been in politics when I went to the Kennedy School and somebody said, take a negotiation course. And that was my big aha moment. I thought, wow, here's a whole framework and vocabulary for how to deal with differences of opinion. I came, I was a political operative. It was all about differences of opinion. It really changed my life because there was a good framework and system for, you still have your differences of opinion, but you have a good way to, to talk about these differences and hopefully come to some good agreements. Okay, thank you. Um, here's an interesting question. Who do you think are the best negotiators in the United States or in the world for that matter? living or from known living or from no, uh, known history? And why do you think they're great? Whoever you well, choose. I'm just gonna tell a little story. Um, so we give out the Great Negotiators Award. Um, when I was in high school, I could write a paper on one subject, anything in the whole world. And I chose Mahatma Gandhi uh, and his philosophy as Satyagraha. And so years went by, I did all these other things in my life. And then uh, when I came to POM, I put together a conference um, of bringing together negotiation scholars with nonviolent action scholars. Um, and I invited Ila Gandhi, who's Gandhi's granddaughter. And she came, um, which was lovely. And that was thanks to Bill Yuri. And we became friends. And then years later, she invited me to a conference in Durban, South Africa. And I know we have somebody from South Africa on this call. And she asked me to give remarks. And so I gave a talk. It was called Gandhi was a great negotiator. And they're going, no, he was a peace activist. I said, no, peace activists are strategic. Um, they know how to run negotiation campaigns. Or, he was just in India negotiating with the British government, with Indians, with um, other people on his side. Uh, many people in conflict are negotiating not only with the other side, but with the people on their, on their side. Um, and, and so uh, Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, these were all brilliant, brilliant negotiators. Uh, and I think it's wonderful to look at their work through that lens and just see how 
how strategic and um, smart they were. Yeah, well, he was among the best, I'm sure. Uh, so I, there is a question, uh, what I think is a fascinating question. Susan, is there a, a next documentary that you want to do, you want to make? Uh, that's, it's really hard to make a documentary. I have to say it started with a Kickstarter campaign. Um, I was doing it in my spare time, even though the program on negotiation was extremely supportive. Um, it's really hard, but it's a great thing to do. And I think short documentaries are powerful because people have so much video content they can, can watch. And so one of the things I'm looking forward to doing in um, when I'm finished with my um, managing director's job at the Program on Negotiation is really uh, reaching out to other people uh, in countries who've expressed an interest in doing something that shows the impact of conflict in their countries on children. I felt that with um, all the talk in our country about Iraq and Afghanistan, there was real war talk fatigue. I mean, those wars have been going on for, you know, a couple of decades. And I felt like, but people will listen to children in the same way with Greta Thunberg and climate change, I feel like children, if we film them talking, uh, can really talk in ways that um, the adults who, who make a lot of decisions that impact them and their futures will listen. Yes, thank you, Susan. So here, here's an interesting question. Do you see a risk of focusing so much in recent years on the brain structure and connections that, that is neuroscience to explain our social interactions and psychological states, uh, considering how complex human interactions are. It may be too reductionist to address hidden social psychological processes we must understand more and learn more about. Yeah, it's a great question. I was on the PON website site this morning and I typed in neurology to see what popped up. And there were some articles um, that I invite you to look at. Um, and, you know, I think there's both um, illumination that comes from realizing how our brain operates and yet you don't want to take it too far or make too many assumptions. And I'm not an expert who should be talking about that. Uh, what I do think has been helpful is the psychological work that's been done um, in a lot of different venues. And again, look in our, on our website. Um, but for example, the work Jared Curhan at MIT is doing about measuring not only the objective value of how you did in a negotiation, but the, subject, the subjective value. How do you feel you were treated? How, how was the experience for you? And, and calibrating, that, that's actually quite important. It's not just the um, objective outcomes. And I think we've all seen a lot of negotiated agreements that fall apart uh, because people weren't looking ahead to how to implement it. Is it sustainable? Do people really buy into this agreement or they just wanna get back home at the end of the day? Or just, So there's just a lot of work being done on that. And um, again, I invite you to look on our website and also um, our negotiation journal uh, is a quarterly publication and it has a lot of wonderful interdisciplinary articles on the latest research in negotiation. Oh, good, that, that will be helpful. So Susan, here's another question. Do you see negotiation merely as a tool to solve problems? How about facing human relatedness in differently, more dignity-based, equality-based ways? Yes, absolutely. I think it's the person-to-person the -person negotiations, but I also wonder what is meant by human relatedness. And Donna, I'm gonna invite you to jump in because as most of you, I hope know, Donna has written two amazing books mm -hmm. about the importance of dignity in how we deal with conflict. And that if you don't acknowledge and protect someone's dignity, problems don't go away. And again, that's another reason why negotiations aren't sustainable. Negotiated agreements sometimes aren't sustainable. 
What well, one of the it? things, Susan, that I learned from uh, our beloved uh, Professor Herbert Kalman is that um, there are layers, layers of uh, levels of conflict. And of course, I think the major contribution that, uh, that Roger Fisher and um, his co-authors made was to get us to, as I said, to look below positions and look at interests. And Herb Kelman invited us to take, go even deeper and look at what he called the basic human needs. And I think these under these deeper levels, and they tend to be more psychological, they tend to be, you know, less concrete. And this is why they're almost difficult to, to even surface at times. I mean, Dan Shapiro has done a wonderful job with, with this emotional level. And I think, you know, these, these um, ways of understanding what creates conflict to begin with, you know, is I think that's the contribution that the more dignity-based um, questioning uh, gets at. But I, in terms of equality, I think uh, it also shows how when people experience gross violations of injustice, uh, especially over time and systemically, how, how much that contributes to difficulties in negotiating. I mean, look what's happening to us right here in this country. So I definitely think that um, all of these approaches that we're talking about, the principled negotiation, Herb's interactive problem solving, my dignity, all of this stuff is just, you know, different entry points into the same problem. And, you know, it just depends on what people are, are interested in, Susan. I agree. And I think that um, what you said about preventing problems before they um, flare up is so important and it doesn't get enough attention. Um, I also want to invite people to look at the work of Sheila Heen and Doug Stone, um, Bruce Patton, Difficult Conversations. It's a wonderful book on how to have uh, conversations that, that really, um, you know, we don't do well or, or we haven't had. When I was growing up, people didn't talk about almost anything. They didn't talk about death. They didn't talk about their feelings. They didn't talk about their relationships. It's, it's a much better world now in that regard. But this is hard to do. Yeah. Um, and I'm learning every day. I'm making mistakes. I try to learn from them. Uh, so it's lifelong learning. But these are skills that I just think can help us have happier lives and safer communities. Wonderful, Susan, thank you. Okay, I think this will probably be our last question. Um, this is from someone in Spain who says that most of the lawyers in Spain are against negotiation. They win more fighting um, for one of, they win more by fighting uh, for one of the parties. What do you suggest she can do to convince these lawyers that there is a better way? Well, it's a great topic. So Bob Manukin wrote this wonderful book, Beyond Winning, uh, about lawyers and how they can do better uh, if they use some of these negotiation principles. And um, we have partners in Spain who are going to be putting on a POM Global program at some point, as soon as we can get back to doing that in person. So I encourage that person to go there and get inspired. I also think the collaborative law practices that people like David Hoffman and others have set up, lawyers working um, with others to avoid litigation, because often lawyers fighting, you end up in court, it's very costly to the parties and you're leaving it up to a judge to make the decision. With negotiation, you're making the decision yourself. Nothing happens unless you agree on the negotiated agreement. So going to court, extremely costly. Sometimes it's the right idea. But, um, you know, I, I want to just say, finally, um, Frank Sander, a wonderful, beloved founder of PON as well, who died um, a while back, was just an inspiration in this field. He was a law professor who was asked by a Supreme Court justice to think about alternative dispute resolution. He, he wrote this paper that became known as sort of the um, open door courthouse. Uh, he used to say, you have to um, put the forum to the fuss 
uh, there are lots of different ways to deal with disputes and lawyers, many of them are problem solvers and peace builders, but a lot aren't. And so I'd, I'd look for the ones who are. Wonderful. Well, Susan, uh, we're out of time. I'm just wondering, is there one last thing you want to say to all these wonderful people who have joined us here today? Oh, thank you so much. And let me just say about my film, if you're interested in having um, a screening, just write to us on the website of veteranchildren.com. It's not on the website right now, but we love to have screenings and they can be virtual screenings. And I just say to all of you, go out and make peace in your community. Um, I wish you all the best. Thank you so much for being part of this. It was, it was very moving um, for me. And Don, I thank you so much for creating this opportunity. Thank you. Oh, well, Susan, the thanks are to you. So go and have a happy anniversary celebration tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of love to you, Susan. Lots of love back and to all of you out there. Lots all of, of you out there. Absolutely. All right. Take care. <laughs>